so this morning, uh, Sirius, I got up really early and saw the star Sirius and it looked elongated. It looked fairly large. Um, and it's always, it's always been bright, but it, it looked a lot bigger. And just, just for some context, in Egypt, they use the consonants KLB, Kolb. And so some have speculated that Sirius is Kolb. <laughs> but then you also have other, uh, <clears throat> other groups around the world, like the Dogon tribe in Africa, and the, all these different groups of people who claim to know these details about Sirius, Sirius A, Sirius B, which is a very small star, and, uh, but most of that stuff we didn't know until much later. Now that stuff's interesting, I don't have much to say about that, just that I noticed that star, and there's a lot of signs in the heavens happening recently. I do want to cover something very curious. Um, synchronisms, historical synchronisms with Abraham, or more particularly with his father Terah. So it seems that his father Terah, there are letters, ancient letters, between uh, the nine kings with, with uh, of King Hammurabi and all these other kings it's basically like five against four kings uh, but in that you also have uh, Pharaoh Neferhotep this is in the 13th dynasty about 1750 BC Neferhotep is I believe writing letters to uh, Terra or Terra's writing letters to Neferhotep I'll have to get the details on it but Hammurabi, Neferhotep, Terra. Terra seems to be a ruler, but not a king. Um, and not well liked either. In fact, he, he's cast out of his lands a bit. Man, what is it? Uh, Urkesh? Or Ur? I can't remember. But he's cast out of that land and made to be a Hipperu. Uh, Hipiru, which a lot of people conflate to be Hebrew. Um, Hebrew is more to do with the language. Hipiru is more to do with a class distinction. This is somebody who, or uh, a group of people who, you know, dwell in tents. They're opportunists. They're, they're highway robbers, land pirates. They, they have no real loyalty or land. Um, but uh, this, this is all during 1750 BC and is it Terah father of Abraham possibly maybe maybe not but in 1700 there was an air air burst which blast the land in northeast, northeast of the Dead Sea, up on the Jordan border with the Dead Sea, where some suggest that Sodom and Gomorrah is. Now, they dated that back, and this has all been peer-reviewed, all that stuff, and it dates back to 1700 BC. About 50 years after Terra's kind of outcast, so this suggests, you know, Abraham being there. The real cool thing about um, Neferhotep, the 13th dynasty, is the 12th and 13th dynasty, excuse me, when we actually see the rise of Sopek, the crocodile god, the Nile god, and they have their capital, they move their capital around quite a bit, but um, Neferhotep, and that whole 13th dynasty, this is when you start getting a lot of pharaohs naming themselves after Sobek. Now, if you look in facsimile one, Joseph Smith names the crocodile god of pharaoh. And people 
have corrected that and said that's bull crap. That's not true. That's look how stupid Joseph is. Blah blah blah. Um, and then some have even suggested, oh well, that's that's actually Horus uh, or Hor you know, because later Sobek did get you know combined with Horus, and then the imagery was actually changed. So, but back during that time. This is the time when you likely you, uh, you start you see a lot of these pharaohs with multiple wives or concubines. Also makes me think, perhaps we have a couple things. You know, we still need to figure out a couple things because Sarah, Abraham's wife, was desired by Pharaoh. Would, would he, she be desired by Pharaoh if she was elderly? I don't know. Probably not. And would would they really laugh at, at the suggestion of Abraham having a son so late in life and at such an old age if his father Terah bore him at an even older age? And if that's their genealogy? I saw someone actually look at um, the Mesopotamian uh, base 60 count system and how would we apply that? Basically we would look at the years of age that they have and they, they would take the years of age and multiply it by 12.36. So for us we take the biblical ages and divide it by 12.36. What you end up getting is ages like 75, 74, 70. That that really was the the general age that people lived to was in their 70s. People living above 70 was considered very rare. In fact, it's not till it's not till Ramesses the second we actually see Ramesses the second live above 90. But the really cool thing about this is uh, you have a 430-year sojourn of Israelites. It's a promise given to Abraham that basically they would sojourn for 430 years. Uh, 430 years, that brings us to the end, near towards the end of Ramses II's reign. Uh, and then we have uh, Merneptah which is Ramesses II's youngest of, like, a ton of sons. Uh, but look at the context that uh, of what Moses would have been raised in if, if the Exodus takes place at the end of... Uh, at the end of Ramesses II reign and maybe the beginning of Merneptah's reign because the first written documentation of Israelites that we have in history right now is five years after Merneptah's reign he writes on a stela all his victories and all this stuff but at the very end you have um, the Israelites squeezed in there in, in, a, in a different kind of poetic form and it seems more like it's a retrospective type of uh, inclusion just to tack that on because my father never took credit for it. And Ramesses II, he did a lot of work up in Goshen and favoring the people up there. The context of wanting to keep, he, he signed a peace treaty with the Hittites after warring with them, after, after their, those battles ever since Atmos I, which, which is the pharaoh who does not know Joseph because the time Joseph lived in was during the Hyksos period this is an intermediate period uh, with Egyptians where Upper and Lower Egypt which Upper is actually South and Lower is North because of the flow of the water but you have the Egyptians in the northern area where Joseph would have been. Then you have Egyptians 
which are more mixed with Nubians in the southern portion. And the northern portion has more of a Semitic, Asiatic mixture. But for a while, they, they, that northern area provided help for both north and south. But as time goes on, they become more and more divided and separated culturally to the point where you have these southern pharaohs. They're like, who are these other guys, man? Like, let's go take back our, our country. And the way they do that is they put their capital capital right back up in, in Avaris and Goshen. And this is when you enter the Ramesseum period. And or before you hit the Ramesseum period, you, you have Akhenaten, who introduces monotheism, right? And after Akhenaten, you have Tutankhamun, the most famous pharaoh of all that we've happened to find. And, and he was a boy, son of Tutankhamun. And he, he, he backtracks away from Atenism, which is the monotheism introduced um, by Akhenaten and his wife, Nefertiti, I think? Or is it Anaxana Moon? Or is Anaxana Moon the daughter? But, um, and this is all intermarriage, family, gross. But then you have I, a vizier, come in, who uh, is the vizier through Akhenaten and Tutankhamun. He ends up taking over as pharaoh. Tutankhamun dies, his wife tries to reach to one of the Hittite, I believe it's one of the Hittite um, princes, and says, hey, come marry me. I don't want to marry this old guy. I, the vizier, he's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. But uh, I intercepts that, kill, kills the, the guy, and um, comes in as pharaoh. Now, he has no children or anything of his, of his own, so he makes his general, Hormheb, the, the pharaoh. Now, Hormheb does not deal with corruption. He's a law and order kind of guy. Um, some suggest that it would have been Hormheb that would have given the order for... Uh, or, or, or that would have been the pharaoh during the time of um, Moses killing a guard and fleeing. Which means that the one who takes him in, the, the pharaoh and the daughter of pharaoh who would have taken him in, would have been one of Akhenaten's daughters, or wife slash daughter, which they served both and took on different names, like titles like that too, but... And this could have been an inspiration of monotheism. Now, I'm not suggesting that Judaism was created and thought up or anything, but everything I've learned, even from hearing it directly from Elder Bednar, when I asked him a specific question, he, and he talked about the coming forth and preparation of prophets and revelation. It has helped me understand that this is the life that Moses grew up in, is having some form of understanding of a monotheistic life, but also being raised by his Hebrew mother, his Israelite mother, for the most part, but still getting this academic structure, this school of the prophets type structure at a university slash temple um, and likely uh, at Heliopolis or, or Memphis but Heliopolis would have been the great library university place that even Abraham would have gone to this is probably where Abraham went for him to go learn um, hieroglyphics this is, and he would have interpreted and written his life story in a hieroglyphic format but with his kind of understanding I mean it, it's kind of like 
he's coming from a different religious background, but he, he's putting in that information into that hermetic structure that was left over. Um, because Egypt is essentially trying to recreate the city of Enoch, but they did so with priestcraft. They had no authority. They had traditions and patterns which slowly and surely got morphed. But it's those things which Abraham is able to plug into. Uh, Moses, I would suggest, is probably the similar thing. So they're, they're receiving pure truth, but it has to be translated, filtered out through their understanding, through their comprehension. They have to display this according to what they understand and know. This is why we see the, the Israelite camp and, and uh, the tabernacle set up like the Ramesseum period war camp. Because that's what Moses knew. That's what the Israelites knew. The Israelites, they they worked with Pharaoh. They, they went to battle. They, they fought with him. Part of one of the things that Ramesses was worried about is that, oh man, this is my first line of defense. These are my big assets when I go to battle. These are the people I use. Now, if, if we lose them... <laughs> Like, we keep them comfortable enough, you know. The Pharaoh before him, uh, I think before Horm, I would have had this fear of, of them and, and would have been probably the one to kill all the children, the firstborn. Uh, that could have come with Seti, too. Or it could have been Horm as well. I gotta look at those time periods. But... Um, it's it's just very interesting because th this all leads us up to uh, what we end up getting in scripture. Th there's another pharaoh. I the name slips my mind right now, but there's another pharaoh mentioned in scripture that is around the time of Solomon, I believe, or. Yeah, Solomon, I believe. And, um, but when you go through the years, their years don't match up. And so this causes a lot of confusion with people. When in reality, what it is, is it, it, the scripture is being written retroactively. And so that person who's named as Pharaoh in scripture wasn't Pharaoh at that time. He was, he was like, a serving in Pharaoh's court. He's, he's doing some kind of administrative position and conducting stuff, but later on he does become Pharaoh, so when it's written down, it's like, oh yeah, we know him as Pharaoh. Kind of like, we talk about maybe like Trump's past, but you'd re you would refer to him as President Trump. You know, That's how people recognize him now. That, that's outshined his past. I would say, I would suggest it's the same the other thing. Um, I believe we are getting prepared for that time of atonement, that sealing. Um, I believe that's very soon. And I believe that we are being taught this. We're being gathered. We're being gathered on both sides of the veil. We, we even have people going on the other side of the veil to be part of that that gathering. Um, there's many practical things which which the Lord has taught us. The with with Joseph Smith, the the temple. Some may say, well, that looks eerily similar uh, similar to the school of the prophets that was at. Dartmouth, or, or uh, is it Dartmouth? Yeah. Uh, where we think that he got inspiration of of the Book of Mormon through a few of the Hebrews and all these other people, but in reality, no. The Lord was preparing the hearts and minds of the people. There's people having visions and everything all over. There was a gathering in period. 
people were receiving it. Think of the difference between back then when people were joining the church by hundreds. That doesn't happen up here anymore. But look where it is happening now. It's happening in Africa. It's happening in South America. Is it happening in South Africa? S South America? I know it's happening for sure in Africa. But another thing to note is a gathering of Israel. The, when the Israelites left with Moses, not all of them were of the lineage of Israel. You had 12 tribes and, or clans, groups, but they took within themselves other adopted families and groups and people. There's people that joined in those clans. This is a pattern that continues on. It, it continues on the scattering all the way up to, you know, going up to England. In fact, uh, Watcher Palmer and I are going to be doing an interview together. And I know he's going up to England next next week. And he's going to be following this trail that he's mentioned uh, in one of his previous videos. But I remember while studying family history, Robert the Bruce, King of Scotland, writes uh, some leaders in Ireland, says, hey, remember, we're brothers. Like, we're, we're brethren. We both come from the Holy Land. I mean, th that's very deep within the English stuff. And I know Jared's gone over that stuff, too, with Christian Homestead. But... It's just so practical. I don't even think I, I, I really stated what I wanted to state when I first started this video, but uh, just some stuff on my mind, and it's very interesting to me. It also gives me a, a time frame and something to look back and think about with uh, the context, the historical context. What did the Hebrew writers mean when they did this? What, what did they mean at this time period? The, the writing in Genesis is, is different from the writing in Exodus. And, and so you want to look at those influences and not always read it as a Western reader because it's coming from an Eastern author. And the Eastern author style and concept and understanding changes uh, throughout the books. That and understanding the signs of the times, understanding apocalyptic language is very, very um, needful. I'm not saying that you need to study this all from an academic point of view, because the academic point of view gets it wrong. It's like hearing an atheist tell you about Christianity, which is funny because that's what it sounds like when people talk about <laughs> talk about us. It sounds like an atheist describing another religion. <laughs> but, um... It, it, there does need to be discernment. There does need to be a spirit. And, um... And it's... We, we don't have all the answers. We don't... But things are getting revealed little by little. And I think some of those steps and understanding comes in preparing our minds and our hearts to accept certain things because regardless of how things happen I believe all of us are going to have this paradigm shift now in my last video I shared how I saw Elder Nelson back when he was Elder Nelson I was told that Elder Nelson or an apostle would come I didn't know how he would come or what car he was going to come in or when it he was going to arrive. I just knew that he would come. And I was standing on this wall ledge watching for him and watching for him. And I called it out before he arrived. Now, please don't misunderstand. I'm not suggesting anything about me. I'm just giving a parallel here. But witnessed and saw and I said, that's him. And I spoke very, very instinctively and I, I anybody listening on could have gone well, that's really pompous of you to really just say that without knowing 
But as it got closer, I still didn't know for sure, but I believed, I hoped. And as it got closer, and he parked right, right in front of me, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's him, it's him, it's him. It excited me a lot. And in that moment, being able to greet him, I saw my mother, I saw somebody in need, and, and I, I, I didn't want to be selfish, and I opted to go help my mother rather than meet an apostle for the first time and, and shake an apostle's hand. Um, and I think that may be a little foreshadowing of, of the second coming. The prophet is telling us, and, and we're recognizing the signs, and we're hopeful, but we don't really exactly know. We see all the signs that, that are increasing and increasing our, our hope and our motivation, but then when we finally see it, it's very validating. But we still need to be going and, and, and ministering and, and doing the Lord's work. It's not a time to give up. It's still a time to help and gather and, and minister. And I think when Christ, when things are revealed, and I think that there's going to be a lot of revelation this this fall. I think there's going to be something very special. And some of it we may not be privy to. Some of it may be too sacred to even share. But this this fall, I believe, personally, to be a, a very significant point. Am I suggesting that it's the second coming? Not exactly. There's many significant things which happen which come um, not, and, and it, it's all a process right <laughs> we have the second coming of Christ well we have a woman who is pregnant nine months and you have the baby that is born but then you have him when he's 11 years old and he's teaching at the temple but he's not started his father's he's about his father's business but he's not engaged quite yet he doesn't announce himself just yet it's not until much later he announces himself. And then even then, it's his work. And then it's a shock. It's not what people expect. He, he's killed. Even after performing all these miracles and wonderful things. But then paradigm shift again. He's resurrected. Paradigm shift again. You have Pentecost. Paradigm shift again. He visits people who never even saw him in, 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 in mortality. There's a lot of processes and a lot of events which are to take place. And he's chosen us to be part of that. Uh, so I hope that we engage and stay in tune, keep ourselves worthy and close to Christ, and focus in on how we can best serve our Savior and help help do what we can to gather others in because he will continue to be merciful but right now there's a lot of it expected of us not perfection but he wants us headed the right direction he wants us when that decision comes of making a neutral choice or a better choice or a poor choice that we no longer take a not so bad choice or a neutral choice or even just the slightly good choice but that we always go for the better choice whatever that may be and slowly but surely we'll become more like him fall on each other's necks heck i thought about this the other day just my son my baby he, he falls on my neck all the time and i, and I fall on his neck and hug him you think you never, you're never going to walk up to a full-grown man or woman and kiss them on the neck. That's weird. But this is what I do with my children. And this is what they do with me. We love each other. We hug each other. And I thought, well, if there was ever a people who were like the people of Enoch, President Nelson has certainly said a lot about our youth. 
perhaps, I'm not saying that they're being reborn again, but this is like the people of Enoch. They, they did they prove themselves worthy in pre-mortality? Or, or is it just that they meet that qualification, that, that standard of oneness that they need to have the evil wiped away from the earth because they're undeserving of, of having wickedness bring them up into this life. So we need to cleanse ourselves. We need to change ourselves and have that separation period like in the days of Noah. And if there was... We get distinct prophets every now and again. And certainly President Nelson is one of those distinct prophets. When they say follow the prophet and he's turning a hundred, I'm pretty sure they don't mean literally crush your bottle and everything. I mean, we should always do that anyways because it's practical and it's common sense. It's recycling. I don't know anybody that doesn't do that. by follow the prophet I think the greater message is what's yet to come I think what if what if he is quickened what if he does reach 100 well we certainly better be following him right I've never seen a more disciplined man that's as close to Christ as you can come. Even if we have political differences or, or don't like what he does superficially, because we don't quite understand it, we're too myopic to understand the full spectrum of things, which I think most of the, for the most part, that's what it is. Everyone's looking at the political aspect or, or the group aspect. My goodness. Doesn't matter. does not matter. Anyways, Christ is coming back soon. Let's have peace. Let's uh, do the hard thing. And, and I'm excited. Take care.